a little bit of an introduction uh, about myself first. Uh, I'm very new to the Open Book Collective. I, I actually only started uh, this week, uh, sorry, this month. Uh, so this is a, a, a very great opportunity for me to speak to international colleagues about some of the work that's going on at the Open Book Collective and what we're trying to offer. Uh, as Lydia introduced me, my background uh, professionally prior to joining Open Book Collective is in open access, uh, specifically as a scholarly communications manager at several universities uh, in London over the last 10 years or so. So I have a long established uh, relationship with openness and open access prior to joining the Open Book Collective. Uh, my colleague Francesca is also on the call and will be assisting me in the Q&A with any of the details that I've not yet picked up. So I'm very grateful for Francesca to, for being here as well. So moving on then, uh, a little bit of context for the uh, Open Book Collective. Uh, Open Book Collective uh, was formed uh, as part of the COPIM research project, uh, which ended uh, earlier in the year, it ran from 2019. Uh, and COPIM was the uh, community-led open publishing infrastructures for monographs. COPIM, uh, as I say, ended earlier this year, but was fortunate enough to receive follow-on funding, which has led to the Open Book Futures project, which is going to continue to deliver on the work that COPIM uh, started and, uh, and del indeed delivered on. So Open Book Collective is part of the wider Open Book Futures project or family, uh, but I'm going to try and limit things to the Open Book Collective today and refer to a couple of the other projects that very much intersect with our work in the Open Book Collective. Now, one of the principal uh, aspects of the Open Book Collective um, is that we understand that book processing charges to be completely unsustainable for the whole community uh, around open access books. This is for three particular reasons that you can see on these slides, being that they are disproportionately expensive, that they are inherently unequal, and that book processing charges also lack imagination. So to go into a little bit of detail around that, the cost of book processing charges is disproportionate. Commercial presses often charge in the region of 12 to 14,000 euros for a book processing charge to make a book open access. And even smaller uh, non-profit presses, uh, such as Mattering Press, uh, where funding has been available from research projects, have charged somewhere in the region of five to 7,000 euros. So even though that's significantly lower than a commercial press, it's still an incredibly high amount of money for the publication of one single book. So we believe that there is a better business model than book processing charges uh, that can lead to greater equity. And that, again, is because of that high cost of uh, entry to the book processing charge market. The only sorts of researchers that might be able to engage uh, with a book processing charge are those in receipt of large research grants that might be able to cover the cost of that book processing charges. Pro disproportionately, the types of researchers that um, have access to those large research grants tend to be in more stable careers uh, later, later in their career trajectory, which entirely removes the possibility of early career researchers from engaging with open access book publishing uh, if there's a book processing charge being levied. And the third strand is that we believe that the book processing charge also lacks imagination as an approach towards open access as a business model. It very much to us entrenches a business as usual approach where everything stays the same, but we slightly pay for a different version of the same thing. So we pay for the publication of a book rather than as a library service paying for accessing the content of that book. But this lack of imagination also foregoes um, a, a lack of creativity around the infrastructural possibilities that we believe openness and open access books truly offer for the future of the book as a, as a scholarly form of uh, communication and publication. So very briefly, we have a, a selection of aims at the Open Book Collective. You, you can see on these slides. Uh, the two central ones that I'm going to try and focus on today are that we want to support a model of open access book publishing that's not predicated on the book processing charge. And as part of the remit to do that, we believe that we need to build a new community, a community of authors, of publishers, of publishing service providers and librarians to try and bring every stakeholder group together and forge a new means of operating and a new collection of relationalities between different groups within the process of authoring books through to the ultimate publication and dissemination of that work. And to approach these aims, uh, we have uh, several key parts of ethos to our, our approach. Again, the first is that we want to rely on open infrastructure. We don't want to at all uh, sustain or promote proprietary infrastructures. And we believe in building and sharing open infrastructures that lots of people can share and collaborate in and indeed make use of outside of our own 
projects and uses of any tools. The second part of our ethos that's particularly important is that we are not for profit. We're in the process of registering as a charity in the UK, and that will ultimately afford us the, uh, the it will be incumbent upon us rather uh, to give back to our community. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a little while, but we're setting up a, a charitable fund uh, to support open access book publishing and to make allow publishers to grow and develop their own approaches with the funds that we uh, take in from publishers and from library services as well. We're also very much community led. So we have a very strong governance structure uh, that is not uh, hierarchical. And what that allows is for any member group uh, to, that's part of the Open Book Collective to be part of our overarching governance. So that means that if a library or an institution subscribes, they have the opportunity to sit on our governance board and elect or indeed diselect uh, governance members if they don't believe that the job is being done as effectively as it needs to. This is very different to uh, many other types of uh, approaches to monograph publishing and collective organisation. We're very much community led, so we want the community to be dictating and, and contributing to uh, our, our approach into the future. And a key part of our ethos uh, as the final part of this slide is that we very much support bibliodiversity. And by that, we mean different types of books from different types of publishers for different types of readers in different types of languages and books in different types of forms as we go forward into the future. That's key to our approach uh, for the Open Book Collective. Now, one of the questions that as Open Access Week is upon us that it might be worth asking initially is, why open access? I could stand here and talk for hours about this particular point, as I'm sure many of us could. There's a lot of reasons to talk uh, to as to why open access is uh, an important approach for scholars and indeed for libraries as well. Uh, on this slide, you can see some of the findings that were found by Nalan et al. Uh, in 2021 uh, with a specific spin to books and monographs. Uh, there's a lot of enhancements around geographical distribution, uh, a lot of enhancements around usage, and of course, for authors, a lot of advancements around citation rates, etc. But to us, there's a lot more than just the benefits of open access in that kind of tangible kind of atomized granular level. It's about an approach as a community towards a different form of publishing. And so the natural follow on question from uh, why open access once we've overcome that hurdle is why then the open book collective. Now we very much see that we're at crossroads for the future of open access books. And as stated on this slide, we as a, as a collective are very much the proponents of a more diverse scholar led and community owned not for, pro not for profit uh, publishing ecosystem that enables smaller and more community focused presses to thrive and to multiply. By this, we want uh, to encourage the scaling small approach, uh, which is um, a, a term that was founded or formed by Yannicka Redima and Sam Moore a few years ago. And that fundamentally means collaborating between authors and between uh, publishers to try and allow publishers to grow, but not necessarily start to monopolize and dominate the marketplace. It's about having that wider network of uh, scholar led and small smaller presses for the open book collective as i say we're very community driven and we want more inclusive options for authors and libraries to be able to support open access books that's very key for us because we really see how the effects of the open access movement around journals has led to very much that business as usual approach where the smaller presses haven't necessarily been allowed to uh, benefit from the policy landscape that is driving uh, certain successes of open access, but not necessarily the successes of openness as that broader project of uh, being more inclusive uh, across different types of communities. As I say, the bibliodiversity aspect is particularly important for the Open Book Collective. And as a related project, um, as an example, within the Open Book Futures family, there is the uh, experimental publishing compendium that we're very much working closely with uh, as a group and they're looking at all kinds of novel ways to approach book publishing from uh, the start from sort of uh, securing uh, a book commission so to speak uh, through to technologies that can enhance and develop the book as a for as a digital form of publishing so yeah increasing that bibliodiversity is very important for the future of the open book collective and as i say we principally work uh, with small and medium-sized publishers and as sort of groups within that uh, what we want to try and uh, articulate here is that we have scholar led presses within the Open Book Collective. Uh, we have university presses within the Open Book Collective, and we also have independent presses that want to uh, move forward with the uh, agenda of the Open Book Collective. So we have diversity within uh, our publisher members already. And 
and we're looking to develop that as time elapses as well to create a sustainable future for open access books. So just to try and talk through some of the common misconceptions around open access books, uh, that one misconception is that authors or funders must always pay for an open access book. This is not the case. Uh, the book processing charge uh, model does tend to lead to that, but there are many alternative business models at play within the field alongside the approach that the Open Book Collective uh, is taking. So some examples of those are the subscribe to open subscription model uh, that's available. And another part of the Open Book Futures family is opening the future. And that's another subscription model whereby libraries can subscribe to a particular package and the publishers that are engaging with that will provide access in perpetuity to a proportion of their back catalog that was not published open access and then all of them the money that they uh, that they receive through the subscription allows them to publish their front title lists as open access so the idea there is to sort of come for the back catalog but stay for the open access into the future so that's another business model that exists around open access that means that we don't have to rely on book uh, publishing charge processing charges but sometimes where money is available libraries uh, and other grants can support uh, book open access book publication where there is some kind of book processing charge uh, levied whether that's a full bpc or a hybrid type bpc but as i say at the open book collective we're very much a proponent of the diamond open access movement where there is no book processing charge uh, and that does require a very different approach which is why we want to speak to academics and we want to speak to libraries to try and encourage different groups to engage with us to try and make that a sustainable model so that uh, funding will no longer be a uh, a barrier to access for those looking to publish open access. There is also a, co a common misconception that open access books are in some way lower quality. Uh, this is not the case again. Uh, there are a, a very broad range of open access publishers out there, many of which are incredibly high quality. And part of what the Open Book Collective offers is a sort of whitelisting uh, strategy. So any publisher that we work with directly uh, under the Open Book Collective banner has been through a strong process of rigorous evaluation. We check for their high standards of peer review. We check for standards of quality production and importantly, their quality of metadata that a publisher produces as well. So that's sort of part of the benefit of something like the Open Book Collective. But for publishers who aren't yet part of the Open Book collective that, that operate in similar uh, similar schemes, you can also appraise their quality by checking that they are listed within the directory of open access books or that they are a member of the open access scholarly, scholarly publishing association as well. And another point on OA books being deemed as perhaps lower quality is that a study by Joe Deville et al in 2019 showed that there was no significant difference in acceptance rate between OA books and closed access book publishers. So again, that, that's strong evidence of high levels of of rigor uh, when an open access publisher commits to taking on a book because they're not just publishing uh, any any work there's a high level of rigor that they're taking to commissioning those books so open access books are not inherently in any way of lower quality than closed access books another area of concern historically is that no one will be able to find my open access book or that oa books are in some way less discoverable this would be a fair criticism several years ago certainly but times are changing services such as the director of open access books have made open access books much more discoverable in services such as library discovery platforms uh, and other scholarly indexes. But there are other players uh, uh, joining that game as well and working collaboratively collaboratively with services like the Directory of Open Access Books. And that's where I'm going to flag another part of the Open Book Futures project, which is the TOTE project. TOTE are a platform that are building and developing open metadata sharing, and they're doing lots of wonderful and interesting things. Uh, we use TOTE in the Open Book Collective to create and uh, showcase all of the publications that are part of the Open Book Collective's publishers. Uh, and there's lots of additional metadata that TOTE are building and adding into metadata schemas. Uh, including author affiliation so that we can uh, find out what academic institutions are publishing uh, with our open book collective publishers. Uh, so the enhancements that 
services such as the director of open access books who are also a member of the open uh, book collective and the tote platform as part of the open book futures project are really developing the open access book metadata and ensuring that, that will be at least as high of a standard as closed access books but in the into the future being of a far higher standard with greater interoperability and making uh, the use of bibliographic metadata easy easier for services uh, such as libraries so the the the, the, la the land is very much changing around Around, uh, open access book discovery. Another misconception is that OA books means electronic only, and that's not the case. Uh, many open access book publishers also offer uh, print books, and that's the case for all of the open access book publishers that are members of Open Book Collective. Uh, we, we offer print on demand or some publishers uh, print books uh, in, in runs. Uh, and you can see on this photograph, uh, Vincent from Punctum Books uh, holding up a selection of their print books to dispel the myth that OA means electronic only. So coming forward then, I just want to give you an example of a, a publisher on the Open Book Collective. Uh, an example is Mison Press. Uh, Mison are obviously historically spun out of uh, a, a German university, so it seemed appropriate to when speaking with yourselves today. Mison published uh, research specifically on digital cultures and network media. They have a strong and robust peer review process, and that's part of their uh, membership with the Open Book Collective. That's been appraised. They also publish Diamond Open Access, so they don't levy book process charges by default and they offer a print-on-demand service for print books as well. Here's an example of a recent book that uh, Mison have produced and I thought would be interesting to show. Again in the scheme of bibliodiversity, Mison as a German press uh, pr uh, publish in both English and German and here's a recent example of them publishing in German and in, in the German language uh, and I just wanted to flag that really again as part of bio bibliodiversity being so important to us. We're working in Anglophone context and very much beyond Anglophone context as well. So, so I wanted to highlight that our, our, our publishers are, are publishing in multiple languages as is deemed locally appropriate. So again, just to come to try and round it out a little bit, I want to flag that particularly when uh, talking to academics, that academics are really an inherent part of our community, but not just as authors. Uh, my colleague Judith, who's a, an academic and uh, a member of the Open Book Collective team, has wrote an article in 2022 where she stated that academics are not passive players in the move towards open access, that academics do have choices to an extent about where they publish and how they invest their research time and can be working with librarian colleagues to evidence and promote the academic rigour, standards and value of open access book publishing. They can also organise with their fellow academics and scholar publishers in the compilation and presentation of data. So academics are a really important part of our community, not just as authors, not just as publishers, but as advocates for their own academic communities. Just to finish on this slide here, uh, the Open Book Collective have a number of key areas of focus at the moment. Uh, part of the benefit of being invited to speak today is to expand our outreach, both within the Anglophone context and beyond. I want to flag again that our grant giving pilot, uh, the Collective Development Fold, uh, Fund, uh, which is to build uh, publishing capacity with publishers, is going to be launched uh, fairly soon. That's currently being worked on. And again, that's part of us giving back to the community uh, and trying to benefit publishing uh, capacity in, in new ways rather than just being part of the intermediary uh, of, uh, of book publishing as we currently are. And in terms of our platform, the openbookcollective.org website, we're working actively on making a number of enhancements to that. Specifically right now, we're actually creating a portal for academics that at the moment is very much oriented towards librarians. So we want to make sure that academics have a clear remit on that on that platform. So we're currently developing our platform to make sure that academics are included uh, in that platform. And we're also developing our Open Book Collective Information Hub, which has toolkits and a whole range of uh, resources for authors, for libraries uh, and every other stakeholder group to take advantage of things that we've learned and things that our colleagues have learned that we that we want to disseminate and allow others to take advantage of as well. So that's the, the immediate future for the Open Book Collective uh, and I would love to take any questions that have come up throughout the presentation now and see if we can do our best to answer them. Thank you very much.